Hi, I'm Matt Ford and I'm here with a live music review. Over the weekend I went down to London to see Dead Can Dance. Not once, but twice at the Hammersmith Eventim Apollo, as it's apparently called now, formerly the Hammersmith Odeon. It was a fantastic weekend. They don't come around very often. The last time I saw them was London 2013 at the Roundhouse and then the Royal Albert Hall the year before. So I just had to go to both uh, concerts because who knows really when we'll get the chance to see them again. I'll just say that Dead Can Dance are my absolute favourite band of all time. There are other bands that I love but no one else really can touch Dead Can Dance I don't think. No one else means so much, no one else communicates the same things to me, the same range of things. Uh, with with just so much intensity and power. This tour uh, follows last year's album Dionysus. The tour was billed as a celebration, um, the dates 1980 to 2019. 2019 is the current year, in case you weren't aware. Uh, <laughs> 1980 being the year I guess the Deccan Dance formed really or at least began to record or to write the, the material that was performed um, over the weekend and on this current tour. It just felt so special because because it was a celebration and there was a lot of there was a focus on older material that they haven't performed in a long time. Uh, I think in a couple of cases uh, there were songs that they've never performed live. They wanted to um, bring some of the older material to a younger audience who would never have had the chance to witness these songs performed live in the past, uh, back in the day as it were, back in the 80s or the 90s. In case you're not aware, the nucleus of Dead Can Dance is the duo Brendan Perry and Lisa Gerrard, both uh, just unbelievably talented people, I mean they're off the scale really. Both in very different ways, I mean they're, they're quite, I guess in uh, a lot of respects, quite quite different personalities, creative forces, but as a, a musical duo and as performers they are so complementary to one another as, as composers. They both bring quite disparate elements to the table. Um, I'll go a bit deeper into that in a minute I think. Um, what exactly each of them brings. I, I'd like to talk a bit about um, some of the songs that were performed. Um, I won't go through the whole set. I've got the set list here on my on the set list FM, the ever ever reliable set list FM. The set list was almost identical on both nights. I guess it's going to be the same throughout the whole tour. You know that's what they've rehearsed. Um, but. Really, they, both nights were quite different, I've got to say, for, for various reasons. It felt like a different, a quite a different experience, a somewhat different audience. The first song they did was Anywhere Out of the World, the opening track from Within the Realm of the Dying Sun, from 1987. It, it's such a perfect opening to that album, and it was a, a perfect opening to this, this concert. Those mysterious cavernous chords that opened the song and then the, the vocals came in, the, not Brendan's main vocal but the various vocalists on the stage all singing together this wordless part that comes as the intro builds and that was that, that moment when they came in I, I just knew it was going to be an incredible night because that was when the, the shivers started, the hairs um, standing on end and all, all the rest of it. The next several songs were, were all early songs um, which would have pleased a lot of old older fans and fans of the early material in particular um, Mesmerism has always been a favourite of mine I guess we haven't really heard Lisa sing in, in quite that way that she did on those first few Dead Can Dance albums for, for some time now because her voice has changed and evolved over the years I think more now she's more kind of um, there's a lot more um, deeper 
more emphasis on vibrato and uh, different layers. Um, I think more early on, I think she was a bit more raw in her vocal performance. Um, more emphasis perhaps on her head voice. Here she is on the likes of Mesmerism and Avatar doing just that, so she can still do that. Um, I, it was it was um, it was incredible to witness that actually. Uh, we had Labour of Love, a song that was never actually released on an album. It was a Peel session track. Presume I'm, I'm sure it was played live a lot during the early earlier years, but um, that was that's a fantastic song. Um, I'd love to hear a studio version. Um, that's probably not going to happen, I guess now, but uh, it's a pleasure to see it live. Another song that was never officially released on an album, um, Bylaw. Beautiful song, which Lisa sang with uh, Robert Perry, Brendan's brother. He was also in the, the live band on this occasion. The, the live band, I mean, the, I think there was eight musicians on the stage, and I won't sort of talk about them all because I'll be here all night, but um, I want to talk about the, the vocalists because obviously you've got Brendan and Lisa, the main vocalists, but then we had Robert Perry doing, doing some additional uh, male vocals and playing various instruments, and also we had Astrid Williamson playing keyboards and additional female vocals. That, that really enabled them to kind of do more with the songs because um, a lot of the the songs are kind of multi-layered and uh, a song like Xavier for example the the uh, intro to that with the theme with Lisa's vocal that's multi-layered and we had Lisa and Astrid doing these slightly subtly different parts in that intro but it was so effective hearing hearing the two parts together by law is such a beautiful song and it's not a song that I listen to very often purely because I put albums on and it, it was never on one of the studio albums, one of the uh, full length albums. It was on a box set, but I, I, which I have, but I never put it on because most of the material on that is on the albums. So yeah, I hear it occasionally. It's It was absolutely stunning live. I've always loved it, but it was stunning to hear live and, and a privilege because it is a, an old song that I guess most people would never have thought we would hear live again. I've been singing it for the past couple of days now as well. Really a lovely song. Okay, I'm back after some technical issues, and my apologies for that. Um, next was Xavier, which uh, has always been a favourite of mine, another from uh, Within the Realm of the Dying Sun. I mentioned the, the introduction earlier on, and it was absolutely stunning, as could be expected, but uh, notably during that song Brendan had some trouble with his voice unfortunately every singer's worst nightmare pretty much <laughs> I felt I really felt for him and I think a lot of people did uh, everyone was very he was very apologetic afterwards and um, everyone seemed to be very supportive which was great to see and um, he said he, that he, he had had the, the dreaded lurgy as he put it and um, yeah, he went off stage, and uh, I don't know what he had. It's like a, a magic cup of uh, <laughs> cup of ginger and lemon tea, I guess, something like something along those lines. And he came back on. Um, Lisa did Sanvian next, which uh, was, of course, Brendan isn't needed for that song. And he came, Brendan came back on and, and was just um, seemed to be pretty much fully recovered. Or, uh, I, he knows better than anyone, but I didn't notice any any signs of him struggling after that for the rest of the, the performance. He did joke about it later on. Um, he came on for the encore, and uh, so he said, uh, "Are you sure you want to hear Kermit the Frog sing this?" Uh, <laughs> which was pretty funny. Um, so it's good that he was able to joke about it. Uh, I hope his his voice is uh, fully recovered in time for the future gigs on on the tour. But even during that song, though, his, despite the problems he had, he was still able to um, sing with the same power because he's got such a rich, uh, powerful voice, very, very loud voice, and 
and he was still able to project in, in the, the way that he always does and, and he still reached a, um, all the, the higher notes in the song. Can you hear that? The host of Seraphim. Now seems like a good time to talk about the host of Seraphim. I've got a Deck and Dance and related playlist playing in this room in case you hadn't um, noticed. I don't know, it's on random, I don't know what's going to come up, but there, there it is, the host of Seraphim. Um, I mean, what can you say? It's I, I, always a stunning piece of work. Seen them perform this twice before, before this tour, uh, last on the on the previous tour. I think these two performances this past weekend were the, the best that I've I've seen from them. Again, it benefited from having the additional uh, backing vocals, especially uh, Robert Perry. The the two Perrys with their their vocals underneath Lisa's main vocal in this this piece really adds so much to the atmosphere. I, I think on the last tour it was just Brendan singing that part and it was still fantastic but it, it just added a bit more to that, uh, an, an extra kind of layer to that, that made it sound more kind of complete I guess. But yeah this song, I mean what can you say, uh, there's a quote by Frank Darabont who directed the film The Mist, uh, he used the song in that film yeah, here's the quote. He described this song as a requiem mass for the human race. And um, <laughs> that's quite a statement. It really does, whether it was intended to have that kind of meaning or not, is is for, for Lisa Gerrard and Brendan Perry to, to know, but it really does carry that much power, that much weight, and it makes that kind of an impact. I was uh, utterly transfixed, especially on the, the second night, the Sunday night. I was absolutely transfixed, mesmerised, stunned by the performance. It, one of the absolute highlights, without question. Just stunning, a stunning piece of work. I feel bad just for talking over this song, to be honest. <laughs> I would never normally have this on as background music, by the way. It's, it's usual, usually the kind of thing that you just have to stop what you're doing and focus on. That's one of the great things about Deck and Dance, one of the many great things. You have to stop and listen if they come on, or you have to focus on their music. It demands your attention. It really does. Another song that demands your attention very much is The Wind That Shakes the Barley, which Lisa performed. Of course, it is a, an Irish folk song, it's a cappella. It was quite disappointing that on the Sunday night um, there were some people to my right um, during that song uh, and some of the other songs. They seemed to get up and go to the toilet, go to the bar several times. The same people, not even different people, the same people. And of course it was an all-seater venue so that thing happened where someone you have to stand up so people can get past and it was really annoying and it's the wind that shakes the barley it's a cappella and you are what 15 feet away from Lisa Gerard singing the wind that shakes the barley a cappella and you're getting up to go to the toilet It's just really disrespectful, I think, and, and it's distracting for the audience as well as, as for the performer. Anyway, I, I won't rant too much about that because uh, I want this to be a nice positive, positive review. I didn't let it ruin my evening, by the way, I should point that out. Amnesia. That was the first song they came back with when they released their, uh, their kind of comeback album, if you like, uh, Anastasis, back in 2012. It's such a powerful song, um, with its lyrics, which unfortunately seem even more relevant by the day. Um, collective memory loss, failing to learn from our past, etc. Another talking point is 
there were rumours that they weren't going to play any songs from last year's Dionysus album for various reasons. The practical reasons, I think, were the main reason, but in fact they closed the main set with Dance of the Picantes from, from the album, which uh, I guess they found a way to make it work. It's, a, it's such a danceable album, it's such an uplifting album. Um, probably the, their purest expression of, the purest celebration of life itself. And uh, such an upbeat track. Really enjoyable to watch. Um, audience participation was encouraged. Uh, we were uh, encouraged to clap along. And um, it was just, it was really fun. I, I would like to see that whole album performed live, but uh, like I say in some of the interviews before, when the album came out, Brendan was saying it would be uh, very hard to do because for practical reasons, all the different musicians that would be required on stage. And then two encores featuring two covers, one of uh, Delay Man track. They're a band that Brendan has worked with. I, I really recommend uh, their most recent album, which Brendan worked on. It's excellent stuff. Um, this, the cover was a surprise, I have to say, because I, I, I wouldn't have predicted that they would have played that. But it's really enjoyable. A kind of uh, dual Brendan Lisa vocal. Uh, very enjoyable stuff. Uh, they also did um, Songs of the Siren, a uh, Tim Buckley cover. I think that was that was Brendan and I think Astrid on keyboards doing that song and that I mean that song is well known to um, Deck and Dance fans anyway or fans of a certain era of music that Deck and Dance are associated with shall we say but I think this is the be best version of the song that I've heard Deck and Dance do because they played it on the last tour but it was a different arrangement and I, I think I prefer this one actually Brilliant version of Cantara, such a such a, a thrilling track. In many ways, it felt like the the climax of, of the evening. There were there were a couple of quieter songs to finish off. We had to, for the second encore, we had the Promised Womb, which was beautiful, beautiful, and um, Severance, which was the final song. Um, I think to this day, I honestly think that is one of the the finest songs Brendan Perry has ever written. Um, it is a masterpiece of a song. It is so, so simple, such a simple, very bare arrangement. And just, just really just a few lines of lyrics, of text, but such a powerful message behind it. Very moving stuff, I have to say. Uh, and another song I haven't mentioned, but Yalunga, first song from Into the Labyrinth. I've always loved that song, but seeing it live, it's funny how you can see a song live, and even though you might have always loved the song, it becomes even better when you see it performed live. And this did, I was, I was completely transfixed. The, the atmosphere was indescribable and I think just, just listening to that song from now on I will always remember this, these two performances I've seen this weekend of that song Dead Can Dance is so much more than just descriptive words I've tried to avoid using descriptive words as much as possible um, and it's so much more than which songs did they play, which songs didn't they play I want to finish this off by just saying a few things about what Dead Can Dance actually means. You know how people talk about head versus heart? How some people are very logical and intellectual and other people are led more by their emotions. There's a lot of discussion about the merits or the pros and, pros and cons of each. Personally, I think there's room for both. I think there's, there's room for a good balance. I think that's, that's important. And Dead Can Dance, yet another reason to love Dead Can Dance. They represent both. As I said earlier, Brendan Perry and Lisa Gerrard bring different things to Dead Can Dance. And 
there's certainly an, an overlap between the two, but in general, Brendan Perry, I think, is more the intellectual side, and Lisa Gerard is more the emotional side. Of course, Brendan is also very emotionally uh, resonant as well in his, his performances and in his lyrics, but he's also extremely intellectual and his lyrics are fantastic. Lisa Gerard usually doesn't sing actual words. That's a whole different discussion, but she operates more on an emotional level. She, when she sings, seems to be able to kind of flit between realms almost as if she's on some other plane when she sings. She's kind of some she's in the room but she's also kind of somewhere else. Uh, in terms of the actual music, it makes you feel so many different emotions and with such intensity. And it also makes you think. I, I believe that part of the philosophy behind Dead Can Dance and the name Dead Can Dance is to bring thoughts that may otherwise have been dormant to the front, to the forefront of your mind when you listen. Thought processes, ideas. They do that via the lyrics, via the philosophy, via the different sounds, the sheer range of uh, genres that they use in their music. Oh, another brilliant song, Indoctrination. Um, <laughs> such a brilliant band. Uh, I could talk about this band and what, what they mean for, forever. Dead Can Dance is passion. It's compassion it's awareness of the world around you of your surroundings it's awareness of other people it's an awareness of nature it's an awareness of the forces of nature it's the right to feel and express emotion in a society which discourages and represses and suppresses that right. That is, that is ultimately what Dead Can Dance is, I think, for me. That and, and compassion and, and awareness of what's going on in the world. There are so many levels of, of philosophy that we could discuss here. Different ideologies and philosophies. If you don't know Dead Can Dance's music, listen to it, imbibe it, bury yourself in it. Your life will be much richer for having done so. There is no other band quite like Dead Can Dance on any level, musically, philosophically. They mean so much. <laughs> I'm really going on here, but this it just shows you what they mean to me. And I know I'm not alone in that. J just the, especially on the Sunday night, the, I, I really felt so much love when they first went off stage after the main set. The, the, the sheer volume of the cheers for them to come back on for an encore was was um, was the, that desire for them to come back on that that love that they can dance in that room was was really palpable. I hope there are more tours, more albums to come. We don't know. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Um, but if not, we have a, a very vast uh, catalogue and some great memories to look back on. 
So thanks to Dave and Dance for that. I'll be back soon with another live music review, plus other content, I'm sure. So stay tuned for that. Follow me on Twitter at Matt Ford Music, and um, yeah, thanks for watching. Love Deck and Dance.